For many of us, soils are black box. We put things into box and we get things out of that box. But we don't have a very good idea of what happens inside this box. We put into the soil, uh, the seeds, the fertilizers, the water, and out from the soil comes the crops. But what exactly happens inside that black box? We call the soil. Farmers and scientists have been studying that question for hundreds of years. They continue to do so today. They have learned that many complex physical, biological, and chemical processes are carried out in soils. Let's open that black box and just a little and learn uh, and learn some something about biological processes that occur in the soil. Because most of the life of life forms in the soil are extremely small. Uh, it is an appropriate term to describe the study of those life forms. Those who study soil biology quickly learn that soil life consists of intricate and complex interactions and cycles among the various living organisms in the soil. It's very complex. The activities and interactions of soil organisms largely determine the capacity of soil to function in an agriculture or any other system. Why do we study soil microbiology? It's because knowing something about soil biological system will help us to better understand how soil management impacts soil biology and the capacity of soil to function in agricultural product production systems. Before going any further, let's review the five basic functions that soil use for crop production need to be able to carry out. Soil must firmly anchor plant root. It must be strong enough to help crops and even large trees. The soil must per be permeable enough to allow any root hairs to penetrate it through. Soil must retain rain that falls in it in order to continuously supply water to growing plants. Yet, it must also allow excess water to drain. The soil must drain because it must also supply air, more specifically oxygen, to crops, to roots. Too much water means too little air and the crops suffocate. Soil must supply nutrients for plant growth and to do so it must be able to store nutrients and to release them to roots of growing crops. But soil must not release those nutrients to draining water. Soil has truly remarkable material to be able to perform each of these tasks. Tasks that sometimes seem to be conflict with each other. In this session, we will continue to consider how the organisms that live in the soil and the complex interaction among them uh, give the soil its capacity to perform all these functions. That what are the functions of agricultural soil? We mentioned that they anchor plant roots, they supply water to plant roots, they provide air, they furnish nutrients to plants, and they release water with low levels of nutrients. Think of an ecosystem that is teeming with life. An ecosystem where there's a great variety of plants and animals. An ecosystem where there is a complicated interplay between all these living creatures, from the smallest to largest. A place where fierce predators stalk the numerous animals that feed on their niche, rich variety of abundant plants and scavengers that clean up the mess that is left behind. What comes in mind? Should be, what comes in mind? Coral reefs? We will see. Uh, savannas, rainforests, each of these are examples of complex ecosystem, but none approaches the complexity and variety and the abundance of life forms in a healthy soil. Coral reefs, savannas, rainforests, if you could shrink down small enough to enter into the earthworm burrow, 
smaller still to squeeze through the space between granules of soil small enough to sit on a piece of silt. What forms of life would you see? What would they be doing? Who would be eating whom? In this session, we're going to do so just that. Let's take a closer look at who's at home in the soil. Who will be living in this soil system? So, significantly, we look at a variety of complex organisms, the different kind of organisms that live in our soils, the kind of functions they perform, and how they make a living, how abundant they are, some examples of how they interact with each other, and how our soil management practices affect soil life. Well, what you see here is a glimpse of the enormous diversity of microorganisms living inside the soil, even, even not only micro, but mesoscale organisms and maybe macroscale organisms. We talk about bacteria, fungi, and, and, and viruses. These are microscale. We'll talk about mesoscale ones, and the insects are the macroscale microbiology. Diversity of soil organisms can be grouped into the basis of uh, um, categorized into size, grouping on the basis of how big an individual organism is, or can be grouped into species, grouping the basis of genetic simplicity, or what functions do they do, the grouping basis of what the organisms do within their environment. So soil organisms could also be grouped on the basis of those that can cause disease and the types of disease they cause because plant pathology which is a type of science that study uh, infectious di uh, disease causing agents is not the focus of this program we will be categorizing soil uh, uh, on a base on this basis okay there even there are different ways we can group my organisms into size we'll talk about size well, soil organisms come in a great variety of sizes. The macro or large organisms are those with diameter greater than 2 millimeters. They're easily visible to human eyes. Examples will include earthworms, plant roots. Well, though plant roots are not soil organisms, but they live within the soil vicinity. Mice, uh, snakes, beetles, millipedes, just to name a few. The mesoscale, though, the mesoscale microorganisms that comes in mind, size that range between 2 millimeters down to 0.2 millimeters in diameter. These include mites, springtails, and smaller worms. Some of these uh, uh, creatures are visible to naked eyes, but many are still invisible. Finally, the micro are the small ones these are less than 0.2 millimeters in diameter. In general, these can only be seen using microscope, though large masses of fungal filaments can sometimes be seen. In fact, some scientists claim a single soil fun fungus that is spread over many acres in one place okay, is actually the largest living organisms in the uh, in the world because their fungal hyphae can extend really for a long distance. Most of these organisms are truly minuscule, such as the yeast, actinomycetes, the algae, the bacteria. Bacteria, for example, range from 0.5 to 5 micrometer in diameter. To put that into perspective, about 4,000 of, 4, of smaller bacteria could line up a head and tail across a head of the pin. The head of the pin can line up 4,000 bacteria. Okay, so this is to tell you how small they are. So, the organisms that we don't see and often forget about the microbiology of the soil. And that's what we will be talking about in this uh, group. Now, if we want to group them into uh, species and function, we need to talk about that healthy soil contains many, a very large number of different kinds of species. Each of these species have different function in the soil. These include animals, many of which are very familiar to us because we see them all the time. Among these are 
the families of soil-dwelling mammals and snakes. These animals are also near the top of the food chain. They feed on plants and smaller animals. The arthropods, which include spiders, insects, and insect larvae. The annelids, which are the various types of worms. The mollusks, which include animals such as snails and slugs. The arthropod worms and mollusks are mostly herbivores. They eat uh, plants. And uh, deteriorvores, meaning that they feed on plants and parts of dead animals and plants. They perform an important function in the decay process. That then in that they mix these materials into the soil. They also break apart large pieces of material to make them more accessible to other degraders. And finally, the nematodes. These are the small round worms. Okay. Uh, they're 4 to 100 micrometer in diameter uh, and up to a few millimeters in length. We usually hear about nematodes because they can be significant crop pests. Some will, will uh, pierce the cells of crop roots to feed. This allows other plant pathogens to invade and cause infections that may severely damage and kill the plant. Most nematodes, however, are uh, beneficial. They feed on insect and larvae and fungi and bacteria, all of which could be plant pathogens. Since bacteria contain more nitrogen than the nematodes can use, their feeding serves to release plant available nitrogen into the soil. Nematodes feeding may account for much as 30 to 40 percent of the organic nitrogen released from the soil. Soil organisms also include the root of the plants. We are familiar with as uh, well as plants we are less familiar with, the algae. Okay? Plants are very important soil organisms because they are the primary producers or they are called the autotrophs. That means that they utilize water energy from sunlight and they use carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to make and to build the uh, their living tissue, they get energy and to make glucose during photosynthesis. All the other life in the soil, indeed all the other life on earth depends on these organisms. That's why they're called the primary producers. Plants pump a lot of organic material into the soil of the uh, crops, crops that we uh, commonly grow such as corn, wheat, beans, whatever, the weight of roots left in the soil, about 25% of the above ground yield, like the vascular plants, algae are also photosynthetic. They use sunlight as their source of energy. They are also able to make their own food. Most algae range in size between 2 and 20 micrometer in, in diameter. The algae also add a lot of organic material into the soil. Some algae exerts, excrete sugars into the soil that help to stabilize the soil structure. And this is the algae. In addition to adding organic material to soil, plant roots have a great influence on the soil biology. In the volume of soil immediately adjacent to them, just, just between the plant root and the bulk soil, that very thin layer of soil attached to the plant root. Okay, uh, this volume of soil is known as the rhizosphere and usually extends about two millimeters out from the surface of a living root. Plant roots exude organic material into this zone, as well as dead cells sloshed off from the growing root. These are considered sources of organic carbon, greatly increasing soil microbial life in terms of number and diversity in the rhizosphere. That's what it's called, the rhizosphere, compared to the bulk soil. The net effect of beneficial uh, for plant um, growth, since the microbial activity tends to increase nutrient 
and water supply to the root. The rhizosphere activity also appears to increase so root soil contact and to lubricate root extension through the soil. It helps the soil root to uh, easily uh, uh, penetration throughout the soil environment. Now let's turn our attention to smaller and perhaps less familiar organisms in the soil. Let's start with the fungi. They are another large group of organisms that include yeasts, mel uh, mildo, moles, and rusts. Although some fungi cause significant crop disease, many are still very important and make important functions overall in the soil and for crop health. The arbuscular mycorrhizae fungi, fungus, shown here is an arbuscular mycorrhizae here, AM fungus. It forms an arbuscule, a circle here in this area. Okay, uh, it may it is benefit to neighboring plant. Okay, uh, it benefits higher plants. We will talk more about them. Mushrooms are the fruiting. Uh, these are the mushrooms. They are the fruiting uh, structure in some fungi. And the uh, beautiful red um, balls are fruiting structure of slime mold. Okay, also known as the yeast, the red yeast. The fungi are an extremely important group of degraders. They secrete enzymes and they degrade woody material. They're able to degrade parts of plants and animals that bacteria have hard time with. Materials like cellulose, starch, and lignin. The fungi are very important in the process of humus formation and nutrient cycling. The thread-like structure, <clears throat> okay, uh, uh, strands of fungi called the hyphae, okay, and also help to stabilize soil structure. And as we mentioned before, it, it helps in the formation of soil aggregates. Some fungi are predators on other organisms, such as nematodes. Many fungi release chemicals into the soil that may be toxic to plants, animals, and bacteria. The first modern antibiotic drug, penicillin, was uh, obtained from the soil fungus, penicillin. The protists here on the other side uh, are a large group of single-celled organisms. These organisms are highly mobile. They are swimmers. But uh, they and swim about in the soil pore water. The protists are mostly predators that feed primarily on bacteria. Consequently, they have a large influence on soil bacterial population. This feeding contributes to nutrient cycling by releasing nutrients that were uh, contained in the bacteria, okay, as they feed on the amoeba or ciliates, a flagellate, the water bear. This water bear should not be confused with, of course, um, the regular bear. It's just a protest that is found in the soil. Bacteria are single-celled organisms. They are also an extremely diverse group of microorganisms. They are capable of degrading a very broad array of organic compounds from sugars, proteins, amino acids, to gasoline oil and diesel fuel, to herbicides, insecticides, to highly toxic organic chemicals. Some bacteria are also extremely active in nitrogen cycling. Some have the ability to convert nitrogen from the atmosphere into forms that plants can use. We will talk more about that in a couple of minutes. Okay, uh, the actinomycetes like fungi, they are filamentous bacteria, but they look like fungi. Filaments uh, are and often highly branched, actinomycetes are also able to degrade complex organic compounds such as cellulose, lignin, and chitin. They tend to be most active in the final stage of decay. Actinomycetes are often abundant in humus-rich soil. They release compounds known as geosmins that accounts for the earthy aroma of freshly tilled land or when it starts to rain, 
we get that aroma from the soil it is caused by the geosmins that are released by the actinomycetes here so the logical question to ask after that brief uh, intro is that how much those microbes are diverse how much might be found in a single soil okay so we expect to find in a healthy soil we expect to find several species of vertebrate animals snakes and mice and etc several species of earthworms 20 to 30 species of mites and perhaps 50 to 100 or more species of insects then dozens of species of nematodes hundreds of species of fungi and thousands of species of bacteria and actinomycetes perhaps as high as 5,000 species in a teaspoon of soil different 5,000 different species and that gives you an idea on how diverse those microorganisms can be in the soil so if we talk about the abundance of soil more uh, organisms how many of these organisms might be found in soil how abundant they are the numbers are truly uh, staggering it also re remarkable that the organisms get smaller both their numbers and their weight tend to increase with these kinds of nutrients it is surprising that soil organism can have significant effect on the function of agricultural soil just consider the numbers 15,000 pounds is approximately the weight of uh, 15 cows okay can be fine in terms of biomass when we talk about fungi in terms of biomass then fungi are dominant but in terms of number look at the numbers of actinomycetes here 100 million and 1 billion of bacteria so in terms of numbers my uh, bacteria are very diverse in terms of biomass we find fungi pre prevailing and dominant in the soil system now we have a picture of the diversity and abundance of soil organisms how do all these organisms interact with each other in the soil ecosystem well a more diverse soil ecosystem will not always may mean more healthy and productive soil in general this will be the case uh, two reasons for this relate to the stability and resilience stability of a system refers to its ability to keep on functioning if one aspect of that system breaks down because we have a diverse soil system, ecosystem has multiple ways of performing the same function like this space shuttle for instance if one system breaks okay when a phone system breaks down there's a, a backup system that already in place to take over on the second uh, uh, part which is the ecosystem resilience refers to its ability to bounce back or resume functioning following a severe disturbance if it has a severe disturbance that affects life forms the ecosystem has the ability to bounce back for example the ability of a soil to return to no normal functions following severe drought In a diverse soil ecosystem, soil organisms are constantly interacting with each other. These interactions can occur in one of these ways, as depicted on uh, these cartoons. Okay? Commensalists, for example, refer to the relationship of these two, uh, uh, two organisms that live side by side, but have absolutely no effect on each other these two guys could just as well be eating a separate tables and be just as happy and they are not influencing each other on the other hand parasitism refers to the relationship between two organisms where one benefits at the expense of the other the guys on the right may not be intend to kill his din dinner partner but if uh, this keeps up the gentleman on the left will gradually deteriorate symbiosis though refers to the relationship between organisms that are mutually beneficial 
these guys are helping each other to eat. Perhaps one has a fork and the other has a knife working together that they can eat more efficiently than eating separately. Soil organisms exhibit each of these relationships. So uh, they're very dynamic and it's very complex relationships. Like this is the commensalist and this is the, this is the parasitic and finally the symbiotic. And we'll come back into this later on during the course to elaborate on these relationships and other relationships available among soil uh, microbial systems. Thank you.